It's the height of the Cold War. In New York, a man mysteriously falls from a hotel window. In Kentucky, a secret experiment feeds prisoners LSD for two and a half months. In Montreal, a doctor delivers hundreds of electroshocks to his psychiatric patients. How far did the Central Intelligence Agency go to fight the new communist threat? Germ warfare, brainwashing, even murder. What's the real story behind the CIA's secret experiments? Manhattan, 1953, 2 a.m. on a chilly Thanksgiving weekend. The Statler Hotel on 7th Avenue. A man plunges to his death from the 13th floor. Night manager Armand Pastor is first to the scene. I rushed out, and there I see uh, a body lying next to this partition. I never expected him to be alive, but he was laying there looking at me, trying to speak to me. A very earnest look in his eyes, wide open. And I kept trying to speak to him to see if I could understand what he was trying to tell me. Was it suicide or something more sinister? The dead man is 43-year-old Frank Olson, a biological weapons researcher for the Army at Fort Detrick, Maryland. What few yet know is that Frank Olson also worked for the CIA. Olson's death is just one mysterious piece in a far greater puzzle one that would shock the average American, had they only known. In the wake of World War II, the U.S. government is engaged in a large number of secret medical experiments designed to help win the Cold War. Exposing unknowing members of the public to biological and chemical agents. Developing techniques for mind control to create a so-called Manchurian candidate even planning assassinations on powerful third world leaders. What is the extent of these brainwashing experiments? How did the CIA become involved in such far reaching and disturbing research? D-Day, the end of World War II reveals the full extent of Nazi atrocities. In the concentration camps, Medical research on captives includes experiments with their minds as well as their bodies. The Germans were doing an experiment at Dachau on things like hypnosis and the use of drugs for interrogation to try and find out ways of controlling people, of making people tell against their will. An attempt to master the art of mind control. Many Nazi physicians are prosecuted for war crimes at Nuremberg. But not all perpetrators face the court. Some scientists with potentially useful expertise are covertly brought to the United States by the CIA under Operation Paperclip. Some of them couldn't come in through State Department visa routes because they were war criminals. So Paperclip and other projects were covert operations to route these people around the State Department requirement and get them into the country. The new scientists are quickly put to work to counter a rapidly emerging threat, the increasing power of the Soviet Union. In the years that follow, the Cold War escalates at an alarming rate, with the superpowers competing for military and scientific supremacy. Espionage is the name of the game. The CIA embarks upon a multi-million dollar, highly classified research program into the covert use of biological and chemical materials, an innocuous term for a frightening array of unorthodox weapons. Bacteria to infect the enemy, poisons for assassinations, 
truth drugs for interrogations. Spearheading these clandestine efforts is Dr. Sidney Gottlieb, head of the CIA's top secret chemical division. He was a chemist who developed the methodologies for the tricks of the trade, the stuff if you watched a James Bond movie um, that Q used to give. Gottlieb works closely with army scientists at Fort Detrick, Maryland, developing biological weapons for the agency's use. Included in the medicine chest at Fort Detrick would have been anthrax, the plague, brucellosis, all the major diseases. In 1953, these special operations at Fort Detrick are headed up by Frank Olson. The week of Thanksgiving, Olson's in New York on a doctor's visit, but details are sketchy. He never makes it home. His family learns of his death early Saturday morning. Olson's son, Eric, is nine at the time. And they basically said, you know, we have something we have to tell you, and, and proceeded to say that my father had fallen or jumped out of a window in New York City. The story is as vague as it is devastating. There were no details, absolutely none. That whole confusion about fall or jump began from that first moment. According to the medical report, Olson's neck and face are badly lacerated. At the funeral, the casket remains closed. And the explanation there was that they said he was too badly injured to be seen. Unbeknownst to the family, present at the funeral are two men from the CIA, Dr. Sidney Gottlieb and his deputy, Dr. Robert Lashbrook. For there's something Olson's family doesn't yet know. Agent Lashbrook was in the New York hotel room when Olson fell out the window and died. The mysterious circumstances of Olson's death raise many questions. Some answers lie buried in his secret life working for the CIA. Olson's specialty is aerosol delivery systems. But by 1953, his career has evolved into top secret research, into germ warfare, and more. During his years with the government, he was very, very um, concerned about what he had gotten into and whether he was doing the right thing. Together, the CIA and the Army's special operations plan experiments on the dispersal of their new biological weapons. More than once, they simulate an attack on an entire city. One target, the nation's most populous metropolis, New York. The intention, to evaluate how easy it is to poison a city by releasing bacteria into the subway system. Staff from Fort Detrick, posing as industrial contractors, position themselves over the subway vents. They surreptitiously drop harmless bacteria onto the tracks, while monitoring agents wait to take samples throughout the network. Turbulence from the trains quickly carries the germs through the tunnels, infecting the entire subway system in a matter of minutes. With a more lethal substance, a similar attack on an enemy city could be efficient and deadly. The CIA is not alone in its effort to develop new weapons against the communists. America forms a tripartite agreement with Canada and Great Britain, the three nations working together to win the Cold War. British research into biochemical warfare is carried out at the army base in Porton Down, southwest England. Porton Down led the world in biochemical research during the 30s and 40s. Porton Down knew about the attempt to infiltrate the uh, subway system in uh, New York. There was a constant exchange of information. It was very normal on any given day to find one or more American scientists at Porton Down. In May 1953, scientists at Porton Down are researching one of the most lethal nerve agents known to man, sarin. The experiments are conducted on military volunteers, but the young servicemen 
have no idea what they are letting themselves in for. And on the board, there was a separate notice, typed, which said in so many words, volunteers wanted to help find a cure for the common cold. Those taking part will receive extra pay. I knew nothing about biochemical warfare. I was unbelievably naive. By volunteering, Ken Earl becomes an unsuspecting guinea pig in the war against the Soviets. On May 4th, at Porton Down, he and five other Air Force men are led into a small room by two technicians. We were told by the two men to roll up the left sleeve so the left arm was exposed. These two men then took two pieces of material and they taped them to our forearm. They then gave us each a respirator and that we were not under any circumstances to take off the respirator. And the door was sealed behind us. It was very, very pokey, a small building. And I found out since it was a gas chamber, which uh, puts the fear of death into you, of course. But this technician, with a vial and a pipette, went round each of us, and he dripped onto this piece of material 20 drops in two rows. And it was a colorless liquid, and I didn't know what it was. I didn't question it. The clear liquid is sarin nerve agent. It is quickly absorbed into the arm through the skin. The effects are immediate. I became absolutely claustrophobic. I didn't know what sheer terror there is in being trapped and not being able to breathe properly. You feel you can't breathe. I was sweating profusely. And I was just, I felt so ill. And I now, even today, I have nightmares about it. After half an hour, we were released, gasping and spluttering and sweating into the open air. Beautiful sunny May morning. Absolute bliss. What a wonderful thing to be alive. The corresponding paperwork clearly states the purpose of the experiment is to determine the lethal dose of sarin. They quickly get their answer. Two days later, another group of six had exactly the same thing done to them. But sitting in my seat was a young 20-year-old called Ronald Madison. And, quite frankly, he was dead within 45 minutes, the most hideous death anybody can ever have. Foaming at the mouth, an ambulance driver described it as like frog spawn coming out of his mouth. Terrible death. Based on the dates in his passport and known previous visits to Porton Down, there is a good chance that Frank Olson witnesses this fatal experiment. According to investigative reporter Gordon Thomas, Olson voices his concerns to a man named William Sargent. Dr. Sargent was the most eminent psychiatrist in Britain. He ran the Department of Psychological Medicine in St. Thomas's Hospital. During the Cold War, Sargent's expertise is sought by both British and American intelligence. He would decide whether one of our agents, one of MI5 or 6 agents, was okay, whether you're going to blow the whistle or not. Frank Olson tells Sergeant what he's seen at Porton Down. He told him, I've seen things that shouldn't be going on. Sergeant apparently has doubts about Olson. Can the American still be trusted with top secret research of the Cold War? By summer 1953, the Korean War is ending. Shocking news has flooded the airwaves. Captured American pilots confessed to dropping biological weapons on North Korea. The germ bombs were loaded uh, 15 minutes before our mission, while ordinarily our aircraft were loaded two hours or more before a mission. The U.S. vehemently denies the charge. The United States has not and is not using germ warfare of any kind in Korea. The communists must have brainwashed the pilots into false confessions. But how? The agency is determined to find out. 
There was a real fear in the CIA that the communists had ways of doing things, of interrogating people, of making people act against their will, that could be breakthroughs. To combat the new threat, the CIA launches its own intense quest to master the art of mind control. They were looking for ways to manipulate and control human behavior. They looked at chemical substances. They looked at things like electroshock. One drug in particular catches their attention, lysergic acid dithylamide, LSD. The hope was you could use these drugs to soften up somebody for interrogation, or you could use them offensively for mind control programming and getting somebody set up for operations. Ten years before its recreational heyday, LSD becomes the focus of the CIA's quest for the perfect truth drug. There's just one technical hitch, how to find suitable subjects. One CIA guy said to me, we couldn't really test on housewives in Northern Virginia. That wouldn't have been okay. So they found street people, they found prostitutes, they found prisoners, uh, they found minorities to whom the CIA at the time did not put as much value on their lives as other people. At the Federal Addiction Research Center in Lexington, Kentucky, Dr. Harris Isbell is contracted by the CIA to study the effects of prolonged exposure to LSD. His subjects are incarcerated heroin addicts, mostly African-American. The deal down there was unbelievably gauche. They had prisoner volunteers who came in and they would be given LSD as part of the experimentation and then as a reward given heroin. In one experiment, prisoners are kept on increasing doses of LSD for 77 straight days. Dr. Isbell called it the most amazing demonstration of drug tolerance he had ever seen. A lot of these things just violate any kind of common sense and basic medical ethics. That you, you would think it would be impossible that doctors would do experiments on drug addicts, giving them hallucinogens, and then as a reward for participation, they would get more drugs of addiction. But these things actually happen. They're absolutely documented. Institutions throughout the United States sign up for CIA research, patriotically serving their country in the fight against communism. While the CIA explores the effects of LSD on the individual, the Army extends its own research to turning on entire battalions. This experiment with hallucinogenic drugs was filmed at Edgewood Arsenal in the 50s. And they were given LSD and they were given orders to march in formation and instead of staying in formation, they wandered off in different directions or laughing, joking, totally disorganized. Well, the Army had been looking for a drug that could incapacitate uh, the enemy for short periods without killing them, and LSD initially looked like it might be useful for that purpose. These tests use military volunteers who know they are taking a drug. The CIA has a different mission in mind, to test the drugs covertly. You might give it to a Russian diplomat at a cocktail party, and you want to see how it would react. Could you recruit him after he'd been given LSD? So unwitting testing was the name of the game. The CIA establishes safe houses in Manhattan and San Francisco. They enlist prostitutes to lure in possible suspects and slip them LSD. Local gangsters are used to simulate enemy agents with secrets to share. The agency listens in, hoping the lethal combination of the girl and drugs will get the man to talk. Narcotics agent Ira Feldman is responsible for finding those unwitting subjects. We got prostitutes to come in and speak to these guys, and these prostitutes would put something, which I found out later on was LSD, and did a drink and make them talk. And 10, 15 minutes later, they'd be spilling their guts, whether it be state secrets or narcotics or murder. 
But at the height of the Cold War, interrogating domestic gangsters is just a practice run. The real challenge lies in field operations overseas, on the fringe of the Iron Curtain. Western and Eastern Europe were the front lines of the struggle against communism. So if a defector came in and they wanted to try a new substance on them, they would send in American intelligence people. In occupied Germany, the CIA hones its techniques for getting at the truth. The potential victims for interrogation are endless. Defecting scientists with valuable information to share. Suspected double agents selling secrets to the communists. All are fair game for the CIA. A person would be taken to a safe house in a secure location. They would be kept there for a period of at least days. They might have sleep and food deprivation. They would have uh, possibly alcohol, barbiturates, hallucinogens, and other medications administered. And then a variety of interrogation techniques would be applied. In order to fully test these techniques, the agency must pursue the interrogations to the bitter end. There was an expression the CIA was using called terminal experiments, which were experiments that would lead to death or vast injury to the person. Among those who witnessed these experiments is Fort Detrick scientist Frank Olson. His passport shows several trips to Germany, including summer 1953. He is deeply disturbed by what he sees. On his way home through England, Olson visits once more with intelligence consultant William Sargent. Two corporal sergeant told me, you know, Frank was very different when he came back that time. He was quite aroused, in a sense, angry, upset. William Sargent is convinced the CIA now has a serious problem. Its Cold War secrets are no longer safe in the hands of Frank Olson. So by the time Olson was on a plane out of RAF Northolt on the way home to Washington. Sergeant has called his controller at MI6 and said, we have a problem. That information would have gone up the chain uh, and it would have eventually reached Washington. Alice Olson notices a definite change in her husband upon his return. That last summer when my father came back, my mother said that she knew he was very upset. Olson's likely witnessed top-secret experiments that few within the CIA even know about. Frank Olson had an incredible storehouse of knowledge about top, top-secret matters concerning biological weapons and substances. And as such, he would have been a person who there would have been great concern if he had started to talk publicly. As head of mind control research, Sidney Gottlieb is the one man who knows the full extent of Olson's knowledge. If Olson's been sharing state secrets, Gottlieb needs to know. He decides to conduct a little experiment of his own. Deep Creek Lodge in Maryland, Wednesday, November 18, 1953. Frank Olson and six colleagues from Special Operations at Fort Detrick attend a clandestine meeting. They are joined by counterparts from the CIA, including Sidney Gottlieb and his deputy, Robert Lashbrook. The invitation, which for some amazing reason we still have, it described the cover story, which was this was a bunch of wildlife journalists who were meeting in the woods to discuss wildlife journalism. According to CIA documents, after dinner on Thursday night, Gottlieb slips a small amount of LSD into a bottle of Cointreau. So according to Gottlieb, when I met him, they were concerned that what if uh, a scientist was kidnapped by the communists, and what if the enemy drugged that scientist, you know, would he be forthcoming? And they were going to test this by staging a scientific meeting and drugging the participants. And that my father was just one of a number who got this drug. Allegedly, all but two of the scientists present are drugged unwittingly. Twenty minutes later, Gottlieb tells them what he's done, 
and the meeting gradually deteriorates as the narcotic takes effect. But what happens after that remains disputed. Some believe Olsen is interrogated. When Olsen returns home, he is profoundly affected. He wasn't hallucinating or anything remotely like that. He was simply somber and was upset. He used that phrase that he'd made a terrible mistake and he had decided he wanted to quit his job. Instead of accepting Olson's resignation, his boss sends him to New York for psychiatric counseling. He's accompanied by Robert Lashbrook from the CIA. But the attending doctor, Harold Abramson, is not a psychiatrist, but an allergist. He's been experimenting with LSD for the CIA's mind control research. The doctor's notes show several meetings with Olson over the course of the week. On the Friday evening, Olson calls home to his wife, Alice. He said he was feeling much better. He just wanted to reassure her and said he'd, you know, look forward to seeing her the next day. But at two o'clock on Saturday morning, Frank Olson falls from the 13th floor of the hotel to the sidewalk below. The CIA claims it's suicide. They offer no explanation to the family, but secretly conclude it was triggered by the LSD given nine days previously. But something even more sinister could be at play. According to the night manager, immediately after Olson's death, the hotel operator hears Lashbrook calling Dr. Abramson. And he said, well, he's gone. And the man on the other end said, well, that's too bad. And they both hung up. The conversation is suspiciously brief. An unexpected suicide of Abramson's patient would usually warrant more lengthy discussion. I don't believe you'll ever hear of a case where anybody who was committing suicide jumped through, closed the window. I think he was trying to tell me that somebody threw me out the damn window. Whether murder or suicide, if William Sargent was right and Frank Olson was a security threat to the agency, his death silences him forever. The secrets of the CIA's experiments remain safe for now. After the Korean War, disturbing new intelligence reaches Washington. Hundreds of American troops are still being held captive, subjected to brainwashing experiments and then killed. Mind control research back home intensifies. The new goal is to cause an individual to become subservient to an imposed control, to the point where he will perform acts against his will and then have no memory of the act. The search for a real life Manchurian candidate begins. Hollywood classic directed by John Frankenheimer, a hypnotized soldier is programmed to assassinate a presidential candidate. Like a clip from the movie, the CIA attempts to create its own Manchurian assassins using hypnosis and drugs. You create this new identity inside that's hidden from the main part of the person by an amnesia barrier. And then using an access code, you can call out this new identity for whatever mission purpose. To produce such an assassin, the CIA faces two main challenges. How to induce amnesia and how to program in new behavior. In 1957, Dr. Ewan Cameron, an eminent psychiatrist in Montreal, believes he has the answers. The agency sought him out because they had uh, noticed his work, in particular with two techniques, intensive electroshock and uh, what he called psychic driving. Cameron applies his techniques under the guise of normal therapy. It's hard to say just how awful and horrendous what Cameron proposed and what our government finance was. There's a three-part technique which started with an effort to wipe out past patterns of behavior. And this was accomplished through the use of particularly intensive, repeated, 
high level electroshocks until no more convulsions could be elicited from a patient. Cameron then plays tape recorded messages through helmets that are locked to his patient's heads. This psychic driving forces them to listen to repetitive statements for weeks on end to program in new behavior. Now the final phase was to try to wipe out all recollection of what had happened and that was accomplished by putting people to sleep for 30, 40 days, accompanied by different kinds of cocktails of drugs. Now that's not any kind of therapy. That's a brainwashing experiment. Since the Greeks first started thinking about medical ethics, the first rule was do no harm. That's a rule Cameron broke. For four years, the CIA fully funds Cameron's work hoping to use his techniques to create a Manchurian candidate. Psychiatrists throughout the nation, at hospitals, prisons, and some of the top universities are similarly on the agency's payroll. Every possible brainwashing technique is explored. One in particular consumes the agency for years, hypnosis. One of the things the CIA was looking for was, could you give a person an order under hypnosis to assassinate someone else? That would have been a Manchurian candidate. But the assassin must not remember his act. You could take an ordinary person off the street, put him through basic training, get him to go out in the field and shoot the enemy. The purpose of the hypnosis is not to get the person to go pull the trigger. It's so that they don't remember, so that if they're captured and interrogated, they can't talk about it. The evidence suggests there's only one man the agency seriously considers for a Manchurian assassination, Fidel Castro. In the early 60s, several potential assassins are selected for programming, but all hypnosis attempts fail, and the plot is quickly abandoned. Then in 1968, an assassination does take place that seems to resemble a Manchurian operation. According to some, the work of a programmed assassin hypnotized by the CIA. My thanks to all of you, and now it's on to Chicago, and let's win there. June 4th, 1968, election night in the California Democratic primary. It's midnight, and Senator Robert Kennedy delivers his victory speech in the Ambassador Hotel. He's ushered out through the crowded pantry. Suddenly, shots are fired. Twenty-six hours later, Kennedy is pronounced dead. As the gunman, 24-year-old Sirhan Bishara Sirhan, is led away, several witnesses notice his trance-like demeanor. He seemed to be in a daze. He didn't recollect any of the details of what he had just performed, and he couldn't explain it. He was told what he had done, and he was bewildered. Sirhan's apparent memory loss is seized on by conspiracy theorists. They are convinced Sirhan's a Manchurian candidate, hypnotized by the CIA to assassinate Kennedy. The culmination of two decades of mind control research. But why would the CIA want Robert Kennedy dead? Sirhan's attorney believes there are three motives. Number one, Vietnam. Bob Kennedy was diametrically opposed to the war in Vietnam. The ending of the war in Vietnam would have gone adversely to the bottom lines of some of the major uh, corporate entities in the United States who were making fortunes on that war. Reason number two. Cuba. Bob Kennedy himself had come to the conclusion that the time was ripe for a deal to be done with Castro and Cuba. And that was not making him very popular. And finally, his own brother's death. He was going to reopen the investigation of the assassination of his brother. That was making a lot of people edgy. Conspiracy theorists believe that Sirhan was hypno-programmed by the CIA. Before Sirhan's trial, psychiatrist Bernard Diamond examines him many times. 
that girl, I followed her. She led me to a dark place. And Diamond was convinced that he was programmed. And this programming was very intensive and very, very deep into his psyche. And it has remained with him to this day. To this day, he doesn't know what happened. Programmed amnesia is the key ingredient to a Manchurian operation. Serhan also claims he's been hypnotized before. He'd recently been studying the Rosicrucians, an ancient mystical order devoted to self-improvement. Hypnosis is one of the tools they teach for focusing the mind inward. Now, Sirhan Sirhan described some self-hypnosis meditation type exercises, and his journals have a lot of repetition, 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 RFK must die, RFK must die, which it looks to me like trance state repetition, focusing on the mission, focusing on the mission, focusing on the mission. In the Manchurian Candidate movie, the assassin's mission is triggered by the Queen of Diamonds playing card. But it could be anything. The CIA documents describe uh, hand signals, tones over the phone, uh, words. So you hypnotize somebody and you can program in any trigger whatsoever to flip them into their Manchurian Candidate state. Numerous witnesses report seeing a woman in a polka dot dress talking to Sir Han in the pantry moments before the shooting. She had a dress with the polka dots on it. How about this girl's hair? What color was it? Brown. This mysterious woman is believed by conspiracy theorists to be Sirhan's queen of diamonds, giving him his cue to fire. The hypnotized Sirhan allegedly pulls out his gun on cue, but does not fire the fatal shot. You have to understand, so much pandemonium. It's almost as though Sirhan was programmed to distract the entire group that was there, allowing someone to do what had to be done in terms of actually killing Kennedy by shooting him in the back of the head. Ballistics evidence seems to support this claim. Kennedy is struck by three bullets, all fired from the rear. The fatal shot is fired within inches of his skull, but Sirhan never gets that close. There's no account that pushes him any closer than three or four feet away from Bob Kennedy in the front of him. Adding to the alleged evidence for a conspiracy is the number of bullets fired. Kennedy is struck three times. Five bystanders are also hit, but several more bullet holes are identified in the doors and ceiling, suggesting at least 10 are fired. Sirhan's pistol, a 22 caliber, only holds eight rounds. More than eight bullets would require a second gun. Historian Mel Ayton has spent years investigating the assassination. He tries to track down the girl in the polka dot dress that was supposedly seen talking to Sirhan. After going through the film footage taken at the, in the Abasta Hotel that night, I have isolated an image of a girl in a polka dot dress standing next to a guy who looks like Sirhan. But it's not him. The accounts of Sirhan with the girl in a polka dot dress are possibly a case of mistaken identity. Ayton believes that Sirhan could have shot Kennedy at close proximity from behind, even while standing three feet in front of the senator. When Kennedy was moving through with the crowd, through the, through the pantry, uh, he turned to his left to shake hands with the kitchen workers. Kennedy reaches across with his right arm, presenting Sirhan with the right side of his body as a target. And then Robert Kennedy was shot under the armpit because obviously his arm was, his right arm was being raised as a defensive reaction. And then the arc of the gun was pursuing Kennedy's head as Kennedy was going down. To determine the number of bullets fired, Ayton sends acoustics expert Steve Barber a copy of the only complete audio recording to exist of the assassination. All of a sudden, I hear pop, pop, pop. 
and then a blood-curdling, high-pitched female scream just after the shots. Two unidentified thumps occur just three seconds before the first pop. I rule thump number one completely out. It sounds like the microphone has bumped into something. Thump number two, I think, is either a door banging into a wall or a balloon exploding. A graph of the recording clearly shows a spike each time the gun is fired. Distinctly, eight bullets were fired. If the conspiracists believe there are more than eight gunshots, then they're going to have to explain the lack of those gunshots being captured on this recording. There is no doubt in Aiton's mind that Sirhan was the lone assassin and the CIA had nothing to do with it. Many hypnosis experts question the entire validity of the Manchurian candidate theory. I don't think that uh, a trigger that would move someone into a hypnotic state where they would commit murder uh, would really work. The CIA itself apparently reaches the same conclusion. By 1968, after investing millions of dollars, the agency abandons its research into programming a hypnotized assassin, concluding it can never work. You do not relinquish your will. You do not become a dupe, a patsy, or a mindless automaton, despite some public beliefs that this may be the case. In 1972, Sidney Gottlieb terminates the agency's research into the biological and chemical control of human behavior, citing its decreasing relevance to clandestine operations. The American public remains oblivious that the CIA's mind control program ever existed. But on June 11, 1975, the Washington Post reports on a civilian scientist who was unwittingly given LSD and jumped from a Manhattan hotel window. No names are mentioned, but the Olsons immediately recognize the story of their father's death 22 years ago. They decide to go public. All the major networks attend, as the Olsons add Frank Olson's name to the list of victims of the CIA. The source for the article describing Frank Olson's death is the Rockefeller Commission report. Triggered by Watergate, it's a presidential inquiry into illicit domestic activities by the CIA. The Olsons decide to sue the agency for their father's wrongful death. This death was the result of CIA negligence and illegality on a scale difficult to contemplate. And within 10 days, we were sitting in the Oval Office of the White House getting an apology from Gerald Ford himself. The family received $750,000 for Frank Olson's death. Spurred by the media reports, Congress launches its own investigation into the CIA, chaired by Senator Frank Church. Sidney Gottlieb and Robert Lashbrook are summoned to testify. Well, there was, of course, claims or thoughts that maybe great things could be done with hypnosis. One small project, uh, in which we had a, a hypnotist uh, do some experiments, primarily to see uh, what the limitations of hypnosis might be. Can you make a person do something under hypnosis that he would not ordinarily do? The revelations are staggering. Eighty institutions have been contracted by the CIA for mind control research, costing the taxpayer the equivalent of $30 million today. The committee concludes the agency demonstrated a fundamental disregard for the value of human life. Former CIA director Richard Helms reveals that in 1973, he instructed Sidney Gottlieb to destroy all records pertaining to the mind control experiments. But some managed to escape the shredder. You can be sure in any government agency there's always an accountant somewhere who has got an extra set of the documents and the financial records included program descriptions and project proposals. Among the files released by the agency are several internal memos written immediately after Frank Olson's death. The documents describe the incident at Deep Creek Lodge as a mild experiment using a very small dose of LSD. 
targeting all but two of the men at the meeting. Apparently, no one had an abnormal reaction to the drug. But there's also a memo from CIA consultant Harold Abramson, who saw Olson the following week. According to him, the experiment had in fact been designed specifically to trap Frank Olson. The contradictions plague Eric Olson for many years. He is convinced there was foul play at hand. In his quest for answers, he finally turns to the one man he knows he can trust, his father. On the backhoe started digging. It was early June morning, 1994. I thought, yes, finally, we're gonna, we're gonna open this thing up. Supervising the exhumation is forensics expert, Professor James Stars. The body was, as I would say, uh, in unusually well-preserved uh, condition. One thing is immediately apparent. There were no lacerations evident on his face and head. This is in direct contrast to the medical report and the story told to the Olsons. There was something else the CIA didn't want the family to see. What is present, but not mentioned in the medical report, is a large bruise above the left eye. But Olsen hit the ground feet first and then fell backwards. Could have been that someone did, as we anticipated initially, cosh him, uh, hit him on the head, uh, rendering him unable to protect himself, and then did the inevitable, threw him out the window. If true, then Frank Olson was murdered. During his investigation, Eric Olson makes an intriguing discovery. The same year Frank Olson dies, the CIA publishes its first assassination manual. And that assassination manual specified the ideal way in which you murder somebody, but you make it look like an accident. And the best way, they said, to do this was from a fall from a high window, at least 75 feet. And they said you should stun the subject, that's the verb, stun the subject before dropping them with a blow to the temple above one of the eyes. The pattern was identical in every respect to what we found and, and what we interpreted from the remains of Dr. Olson. I think that Frank Olson was intentionally, deliberately, with malice aforethought, thrown out that window. But investigative reporter John Marks disagrees. I spent an incredible amount of time researching this question. I never found any evidence at all that Olson was pushed out that window. I think you have to face the facts here that when you're doing this kind of government illegal and moral top secret work, you have to be prepared to face the consequences which include disposal of problematic people. Well, what other cover story can you tell besides suicide? In the fight against communism, the government sacrificed the rights of many individuals. When Professor Stars asked Sidney Gottlieb about the CIA's secret experiments on humans. Gottlieb claimed he would do the same again today. He said, you do not know that I had the safety and security of our country in my hands. During the Cold War, it seemed that almost everything was justified, and if you were against it, you weren't patriotic. In the climate of the Cold War, or in all of human history, the basic motto is war is hell and you've got to do a lot of bad stuff and a lot of people die and get hurt. But we justify it because we need to do what we need to do to protect America. This is the bind that we're in as a culture. What can we justify in the name of national security? Can we justify medical atrocities? Apparently. <laughs> 